again, before we welcome our speakers to the stage and begin proceedings, I'd like to acknowledge and pay respect to the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. It is upon their ancestral lands that the University of Sydney is built. As we share our own knowledge, teaching, learning and research practices within the University, may we also pay respect to the knowledge embedded forever within the Aboriginal custodianship of country. The Library Cultural Competence Community of Practice is delighted to welcome you to this, the last seminar in our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Knowledge Sharing Seminar Series. Offered in conjunction with the Office of the Deputy Vice-Chancellor, Indigenous Strategy and Services, our seminar series includes a total of six talks held during 2018 and presented by experts on areas including history and language, cultural astronomy, connection to country, visual arts, medicine, and perspectives on gender. Today, our sixth and final seminar focuses on gender perspectives, and we'll hear from three distinguished guests, Dr. Sandy O'Sullivan, Willow Madawa, and Darren Butterdean. Our first speaker today is Dr. Sandy O'Sullivan, an Aboriginal Woodbury woman and Associate Professor in Creative Industries at the University of the Sunshine Coast, Ambassador for Indigenous X and an enduring Australian Teaching and Learning Fellow. For 27 years, she has taught and researched across gender and sexuality, body performance, design, and First Nations identity, and holds a practice-focused PhD across these intersecting areas. Sandy recently completed an internationally focused Australian Research Council program examining the representation and engagement of the First Nations people across 470 museums and keeping places. In 2017, she was funded by the Canadian government to give a keynote on queer representations in museums and galleries for the Museum Queries Symposium in Winnipeg as a central activity of the Thinking Through the Museum Collective. Sandy is continuing her engagement with the collective and also working on both an ARC image map mapping creative practice across the Barclay region of the Northern Territory and an Australian Council for the Arts Commission report on the state of First Nations performance across theatre and dance. This presentation on First Nations queer representations across museums of significance, Sandy will consider the ways that queer First Nations people are represented in museums of national significance and will explore their roles in resisting and challenging reductive approaches to identity. Sandy, welcome. Please. That sounds like a lot. <laughs> so I'm gonna, gonna try and see how I go with that. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging the always owners of the land on which we're meeting today. It's a wonderful space always to be in. Um, I spent a lot of my formative years, a lot of the pictures that you see in the early part of this are actually from um, my time in Sydney. Um, I am going to talk a bit about identity because it's the key thing, it's the key moment, it's the most important part of this space of representation in um, social history museums. Um, but also because it's agentic, it's a way that we can bring agency. I'm a Wiradjuri woman, so, and I'm assuming everybody knows where the Wiradjuri is. Uh, it's, it's the great big bit down the bottom. Um, everybody knows where it is, sure, yeah. So, um, I'm just going to go through. Um, I'm going to go through a little bit about me as a kind of background to this, um, uh, and this is in part to give you a sense of uh, why I started to look at museums in the way that I did. 
uh, there's a kind of funny story about what happened with that, and it's it's a, a, a little bit further along in the origin story of me, um, but I worked for a very long time in the repatriation of human remains. Uh, that is the repatriation of human remains, in particular held by museums around the world. Uh, and I worked for a couple of different organisations in that. I had a moment uh, where I was visiting a university in the US and when I, in 2009, and I was doing some lectures there and there was a social history museum there. I walked in the front door of, um, of, a muse of the museum and as I walked in the front door, the curator ran out the back door when they saw me coming, um, which was sort of hilarious, but also awful. You know, it became this whole, all oh, right, so I'm like a problem that needs to be solved. Uh, and of course, the answer is yes. Um, you know, I, it is their problem to solve. But the other problem with it is that it kind of forgot some really crucial things in this, and that's that we actually contribute wonderful things to museums and to museum spaces, but museum spaces are really dangerous spaces for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people too, not just because of the, the, the fact that they've gathered and retained and managed our actual bodies and our ancestors, but because that space of representation often doesn't use our own voice. So I started to become interested in how we could look at what worked, you know, so a really kind of Pollyanna-esque approach to this, like what actually works in this space of representation. And it sounds easy, um, but when you put the emphasis on the museum itself telling you, then suddenly it becomes really complex for them. Uh, surprisingly, museums don't like to tell you what um, works. They kind of like to tell you what they haven't done very well and what they hope to do in the future. But they find it very difficult to articulate what works and I found that really intriguing. So to start with, this is, these are some of the complexities of my identity and complexities of identity was something that I didn't quite understand that I was, um, to the level that I was looking at in the work that I was doing across the museum. So I'm going to launch you into the me, but I'm one person and I'm an example. And you guys are all your own individual people and you know that you have a complexity, that you're more than one thing. And so enlisting all of this, I'm not going to read it off, you can read it. Um, this is a little about how I describe myself. It's a bit about the things that matter to me. It's a bit about how other people see me and it's a bit about how other people don't see me. Um, so, so identity became really important when I started to look at this process um, because I'm here now kind of thinking about why in this 470 museums that I looked at around the world, physically went to around the world over a period of eight years and I'm wondering why it took me five years to realise that I wasn't looking at gender and sexuality when I'd probably spent 20 years looking at it in other contexts. So I had isolated it and part of the reason was that it actually wasn't very apparent or very present. Um, certainly what would be framed and frequently framed as alternative sexualities weren't necessarily present in the representation or even engagement of First Nations people. The exception, of course, was when people were making art, when they were making performance, when there were people who were living now. But historically, there was almost no material. Now, that doesn't mean that people haven't done work on this. It doesn't mean that there's not evidence. But it does mean that there's a kind of curatorial bent. So you might be wondering why on earth I was looking at social history museums. You know, they're not the greatest spaces. They're kind of the dangerous spaces from a First Nations perspective. But the reason, that was really the reason. I wanted to look at the, the, the more difficult spaces. It's easy to look at art galleries. Um, it's easy to look at spaces where the engagement is very direct, where you have an artist who's there. I'm not saying they're unproblematic. I'm just saying that it's, it's far more connected to look at performances that are happening now, to be able to look at that diversity. But the further back we go, it becomes reductive, or the more that it's describing a whole of community, because sometimes it's contemporary representation too, it becomes much more reductive. It's reduced to a really simple kind of understanding. And I found that really interesting because I kind of understood that that was what was happening. Um, but I, so I'm going to shift through a whole bunch of... Uh, 
of, um, of photos now, but I've been working with um, the museum queries um, group in particular. So I'd gone out there for the keynote, but we have a range of work that has come out of that project. And the majority of it is a recognition that there just isn't a whole lot of material that is being gathered and that there is no central place for it to be gathered. So there's no way to be able to corral this. And what's interesting is that although there are some remarkable archives around the world, that are capturing this, almost none of them will burrow down and look at First Nations contexts um, within that. So if we're looking at queer, or the, you know, there are very few um, queer uh, um, angles to um, First Nations collections. And so that became really interesting. So this wasn't just about presentation, it was about how um, people were coming to gather the material that they valued as an institution. So, um, so I'd come out of a background of, I was a musician, well, I still am, I teach music. Um, I was a performer. And what you probably notice with this is that my gender presentation is pretty uh, masculine, or at least it's not what I used to frame as feminine. I guess I used to frame as masculine and now I kind of frame as me. Um, and a lot of people frame as genderqueer. Um, at the time that, this, this, and this were done, I was absolutely straight-ish. Um, so uh, I identified as straight. And of course, the conflation of gender and sexuality, one of the reasons that I'm, I'm showing this off is I don't want to do it with other people because I think that's a really tricky path to go down. But the, but the truth is that we conflate gender and sexuality all the time and there's a complexity with it. So when people who are not from a community are representing another community, it's actually a pretty dire thing to start to conflate that as well. And so, and when you add distance into that, it's true what they say, the past is a foreign country, it's very hard to see back and to imagine into that space. Then I think what's happening curatorially is that there is this fear that somehow you're going to wind up with um, something that is so, um, tricky that, okay, by this time I definitely was out and for some time. Um, but the connection then between First Nations and, uh, and any kind of genderqueer or qu queer more broadly uh, connections is really interesting. Um, you know, we were just reflecting, there was a text that, was, that came out a few years ago, and some of you may know it, um, called Colouring the Rainbow, which was stories from a whole range of, of people. You know, we need more of these books. It's bizarre that it was the first time that there was a book that was First Nations queer people talking um, about their experiences. And it was an edited volume, so there are, I think, 25 people, um, people's stories. I've, I've got one on uniforms, um, and this kind of uniform, that is. And it's a really, it's an interesting space because it actually seems incredibly diverse. Um, you know, it's individual people's stories across this range. But the editor had, had asked me um, who in the academy, and we were just saying this, who in the academy uh, would be able to do this? You know, are there any queer um, academics out there who are Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander? And I think I reeled off maybe 40 names um, and nobody I think I was the exception, but I wasn't doing very much at the time either. Very few people were doing anything, writing anything about gender or sexuality, um, which was really fascinating. So, so there was a dearth of kind of engagement in that space. And I think there are a lot of reasons, and a lot of it has got to do with the external. It's not the internal, it's the imperatives that are, that are placed on us about the work that needs to happen. And so I did this uh, work um, there's, there's, uh, um, on toilets, toilets. Um, as you can see, that's me sitting on a toilet, looking very unsuccessful um, in terms of, not in terms of the toilet, but in terms of, um, of my, I think each gender presentation has its own issues, which is really interesting because of course it does. If in fact, what I'm trying to be is a representative, the point is that, am, am I, is anyone doing that? You know, and what happens in the context of a social history museum is quite different to what happens in the context of art making, 
where I don't have to represent everyone. This isn't what Wiradjuri queer people look like um, at all, not that, but that. So I had a really interesting process with this, with this particular project in 2006. And that's that I connected up um, intergeneity, um, gender and sexuality, and I had quite a heavy duty piece that was on um, this particular text. And it was very much about my family, it was about my own experience, um, but it was really about the experience of a lot of people, I, I guess, but again, not wanting to take the permission to, talk, to tell other people's stories in that way. Uh, I got a lot of criticism uh, about it. It was a strange uh, level of criticism, but it was around the idea of how, um, and by the way, it didn't come from community, it didn't come from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, but it was, what, what's the connection between this and gender and sexuality? And the answer is in the body, you know, in the person. I mean, this is what diversity is, is that we're not one thing. You know, we may be here to talk today about um, a, a thinking about sexuality and gender, but of course, when we see this represented, for instance, in museums, we don't want to see something that's so tidily um, framed that in fact, we just end up looking like an object that it is known and that can be um, shaped in a very particular way. And so, so anyway, I did this project. This was the project that I was doing and I was looking at what works in the museum space. And I went around to all of these places. So this is my five years of completely being um, oblivious, even though I should have known better, um, and asking the question of what works. And people were telling me things. And they were telling me things about gender and sexuality. And when I went back to look at my data, I thought, bloody hell. I mean, my data was people telling me things. You know, and I coded it against the, the expected ways that people would talk about engagement, you know, are you representing the community? Who's the, is the community involved in actually making this? Does the curator come from a community? I mean, there were all sorts of things that were very obvious from the way that people responded. So I went to the National Museum of the American Indian, wonderful space. I don't know if anybody's been there, but it's a, you know, it's a, it's, it's a really interesting space. It's really problematic. I mean, you know, you've got like 3,000 communities because um, it's hemispheric. Um, represented within a, um, a single museum. It, it faces out against, the, it's on the National Mall in Washington DC, or one of the museums of it uh, are, and it's, um, so there's two museums, one in New York as well. It's the Smithsonian, it's part of the Smithsonian, so one, it's, it's one of the 21 museums of the Smithsonian. It's, um, it, the fact that it's facing the Capitol is kind of remarkable. Uh, th it's unruly, untidy, and so are the exhibitions. Um, part of what I want to, talk about is the shape around representation rather than explicitly show some parts of it. Um, you know, one of the things that Dennis Sodig, um, and uh, Dennis Sodig does as a cultural interpreter, um, is that for five years every day he would, um, he would come out and he'd start a sequence of, has anybody seen Dennis Sodig performing this? No? Um, so he'd come out with, um, and he'd say it's a fiction, you know, it's a, it's, it's a Western movie fiction. That's not what drumming sounds like in First Nations contexts in America. So we'd get something that people understood, the kind of, this idea of a native drum beat. And he'd just challenge it and go, that thing that you know, I'm going to bring you on this journey. So it was very much about this process of not just normalizing, but, but getting people to laugh at these ideas that were clearly constructs that weren't helpful, you know? Um, so I asked all of these people who worked at the museum, you know, what, what works, you know, what works in this museum? They came from different places, you know, some of them were people who had done, um, everybody from security through to the director of the museum, through to education, through to curators, and um, they all said different things, but they all said this, um, they all said the cafe, um, and it's, a little about ingestion, but it's also, and this goes to the heart of this issue of representation. Nobody actually needs museums. You know, they're, they're nice. Sorry, I'm sure I've got museums people here and they're really important. Um, but, but we don't need them. You actually do need to eat. And so that idea of engagement with food is something that's a very, it's a very present 
um, process for people. They can feel very connected. And of course, it can also be quite cynical in the way that it's presented. It has to be complex. I think there's a complexity to the way that Mitz Tum works. I think it's magical that if the Capitol building is up there, this is the first restaurant that they get to. There's no, uh, doesn't cost anything to go into the NMAI, so people can walk straight in, go through the museum and go in there. Incredibly agentic, you know. It's, and so there's some interesting processes with this. I'll just skip through these. I, I, actually, I was about to skip through these, but I'll just show you a little bit of them. So there's all of these processes of engaging with community. You know, a lot of what I was doing is I was trying to work out is this something that can work in Australia? Can we have a national museum that works in this way? Um, and I, I think the findings were confusing, but I think the answer was no, um, it can't, because you know, the problem is Washington DC and the problem is Canberra and the problem is Sydney and Melbourne, where's it gonna be? And so a whole lot of this became about you know, what you could take to other places and what you could bring from other places. So this Ramp It Up is a really good example. Um, and Native Words, Native Warriors as well. These became both online spaces so that you could see them pretty fully online, but they also became touring exhibitions, touring for up to eight years. And so there was an opportunity for it to be trotted out. There was an opportunity for it to um, engage in areas that showed a complexity of identity. So this showed the fact that th you know, this was young people in, uh, across three different communities in the Southwest who were skateboarding. And it showed a very agentic way of thinking of their, of their work. Um, Native Words, Native Worries reminded people of the power of, um, of code talkers through the Second World War where um, multiple languages were used, actually six different languages were used um, as a strategy to be able to pass uh, messages on um, that couldn't be decoded by um, the uh, enemy. So, um, so this, and Indivisible talks about the connection between two communities um, and what that means and how it is indivisible and very specifically it's about um, uh, First Nations, uh, US or uh, uh, African American and Native American ancestry um, combined and, and a lot about the shared stories but also what that means. I think I'm just going to scoot past this. I'm, actually, this is a really good example, Mashantuck at Pequod, if people haven't been there, it's probably the largest First Nations museum in the world. Um, in fact, I, I would argue that it's probably one of the largest museums in the world. Um, and uh, if you include the outside area, they've, <coughs> they've made that argument. And it's a remarkable space uh, in a whole lot of ways. But the reason that I've got it in here is that it's very much a, a sequence. It's one of those encyclopedic museums that works in chronology. So, you know, so it's really about going, let's start at the beginning, let's look at our origin, and let's move through to the present era. And there's some interesting moments with this. And again, in terms of representation of identity or presentation of identity, there were choices made by, by Pequot community that other um, people may not make about the Pequot community. And so again, it becomes about who tells the story and what story they want to tell. And so you see this interesting change that happens. So this is contemporary pictures of Pequot tribe that's at the end. So um, and I, I've spent a lot of time in that museum and I've overheard a lot of conversations uh, as you do. And it's a very interesting space in a whole lot of ways because there's two things that happen that I think are remarkable about that space. One of them is that there is a, um, about halfway through the chronology of what, you know, what the community is presenting, there is a, um, a, a film. It's a 40 minute film. Uh, and it's a film about the Mystic Massacre. Um, <laughs> which happened at the time of invasion and it was brutal and so you kind of get halfway through go in and watch this mu this film and children are dying um, it's pretty graphic uh, it's got very high production values it looks great and then you, i just see these very nice um, 
white older people walking out of there and sort of being horrified. Um, I don't think you see that in a space that's not First Nations run. I don't think you see that challenge. Um, and it costs about 30 bucks to get into too. So it's like, give us 30 bucks and we're gonna horrify you. But it's also telling a really, really crucial story. And in public museums, do you get that? You know, and, and I think that's a challenge. Um, can we tell the com complex stories that we need to tell? Can we tell the hard stories? Um, and can we tell the great stories as well? You know, can we actually talk about success in a very particular way? Pequot community have had a very strong role in gaming, for instance. Can they tell that story? You know, can they tell the story of, um, of what it means to come up with poker machines? Um, and they do. They say, look, we've actually done all of this work. You know, so it's not buying into the rhetoric of this is terrible that communities are doing this and oh, the shame of you know, gambling. You know, the, the, the mainstream community doesn't have cast on it in the same way, of course. So it's agentic. It's, it's the perspective of the people who are doing the work. Um, and so the other thing that happens, and that's why I show you these images at the end, is that there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of dioramas in this museum. There's a lot of money in it. There's a lot of, lot of life-size dioramas all the way through. And there's a really interesting thing that happens that I didn't clock until maybe the third time that I went through the museum. And that's that people start to look different. They actually start to physically look different over the time that they're presenting people. And of course, you get to the contemporary community and you'll probably notice, um, or you probably won't be surprised to hear that um, the that the Pequot community were heavily involved in Indivisible, of course, um, and in part because there's a lot of um, people who are al also have African-American ancestry who are um, Pequot community. And that's what I was overhearing this, but, what, but they're black. How can they be black? And like, really? How can you be black and native? Like, how can, is it really that hard to understand? And yet that's exactly the kind of message. So it became about this reductive idea, one idea, one way of being able to see people. And anything else could only be written back to the idea of the dominant. And so I went to, uh, the next part of the process um, with this was going through to um, the, so I think I'll just reel back by saying I, um, in, this, in this project I was looking at um, First Nations people in the US, the UK and Australia. Uh, and you heard that right, First Nations people in the UK um, as well. And the reason was that when I did the focus groups, I had an elder in the community in Brisbane tell me, ask me, after I'd done a whole, you know, schmick presentation on stuff and thought I was very clever um, and saying, yeah, I'm gonna go and look at the US and see how they do this representation. And yes, multiple communities, lots of languages. And then we're gonna look at what's happening here and see the connections and see this in a really broad way. And, and she said, oh, why, didn't you, why aren't you looking at the UK? And I said, oh, no, no, honey, this isn't like the work I used to do on repatriation. This is looking at positive um, representation. And I uh, got incredibly shocked because she said something that I'd never thought of before. Um, and that, uh, yeah. Um, and it was, you can tell a lot about how people represent others by how they represent themselves. And I immediately thought, um, I, I, won't th I won't say the word that I thought, but I thought, well, I'm gonna have a whole lot of work I have to do in the UK, because I knew that it would be a challenge there that there were a whole lot of cultural reasons why this would be quite tricky. Not practical reasons and not real reasons, but cultural reasons. So, um, so, so I had, um, I won't go into huge detail on it because I'll run out of time, but I, I had some challenges there and the challenges were really interesting. And uh, so National Museum of Scotland actually has a whole lot of really interesting things around um, identity and around a kind of sense of cultural identity that's quite complex. Um, but I did have a really interesting moment of talking to people about this idea of how, um, how culture is presented and how it's, uh, and this was almost the first time that I started to think about gender and sexuality, so sorry it's taken me this long 
but you're on the journey with me. It took me that long to work this out, I'm afraid. And that was when I came to this, this is, uh, sorry, just gonna scoot ahead to this picture. Um, this is a picture, this is a uh, very hard to see, sorry, a picture of, um, of a, um, it's, it's a character that uh, had, had been dug up uh, from, so a, a couple of thousand years BCE, so um, 4,000 years ago, 4,500 years ago. And it's a figure that was dug up along the Thames, so it was dug up by Thames, um, uh, sorry, uh, MOL archaeology. And it's a really interesting um, figure because I spent a lot of time going, wow, that's really interesting that they side by side have London was formed 2,000 years ago, and then at the same time and on the same slide, they've actually got something that says uh, this is from 4,500 years ago. And they're talking about a, a vibrant community already existing there, um, but suddenly the first time there's a vibrant community is you know, more than 2,000 years later. And obviously I was very focused on that because that's kind of what I kept coming back to with the people that I was talking to, is you must have First Nations people. Like, you know, you don't have to talk about a through line of this. You know, I'm not getting into a space of talking about a kind of nationalism, but you have to know that it didn't just start 900 years ago, and which is often where the story begins in terms of British representation. And so there's a, the, so there was an interesting moment with that where I looked at it and then started to read around the figure and realised that they had gendered it one way, then another way, then another way. Then I started to realise that this had happened with multiple very old objects. And so I'm just going to scoot through these. Uh, you're probably familiar with some of these. Oh, look, a lot of people know um, Venus of Willendorf, so the Willendorf figure at the top, um, which is framed as a fertility figure, no doubt is. Um, well, maybe not no doubt, but is probably. Um, but there's a few of these, um, these objects, most of which are from some kind of bone or um, ivory, and... I'm just going to mention two of them. One is um, Lion Man, which is considered the oldest of these Ice Age figures. So it's 40, 42,000 years ago, maybe up to, um, so uh, 38 to 42,000 years ago. And you can see Lion Man well enough to see that there's something at the front that might be a penis, except that it's challenged constantly with this idea that uh, it actually looks like a female lion's head. And so there's, so there's all of these schools of thought. And what's interesting is how important this has been and who it's mattered to. This idea of being able to frame and understand gender in this context of kind of deep, getting back into the past and not seeing it as a through line. I mean, when we talk about, as Aboriginal people, when we talk about the past, it's not necessarily disconnected from the future, from the present and from the future. And so, but there's an interesting thing here where this becomes a disconnect of object being examined and then determination being made around it. So, so I became really interested in, in that. And uh, it also became a kind of solution for me. So I'll just scoot forward to show you just a couple of things before I um, finish up. And yes, I'm just getting to the uh, meaty part of this, obviously. Um, but that's, I was really interested in this, um, the National Museum of Scotland's Early Peoples exhibition. They actually talk about we, us, our, so it's very much like a native museum. Native museums do that, First Nations museums do that. I'm using the term native in the way that it might be used in the US. Um, so, but f a lot of the First Nations museums that I went to talked about that. They talked about, uh, you know, centralising ontologies, they talked about own experiences. And so they'd found these objects and they were really, really hesitant to put them onto something that looked masculine or something that looked feminine. So they made what was framed as gender neutral. I'm not sure that it works so well, but you know, but it certainly wasn't, you know, if that's the intention, if the intention is that. They, they didn't have a sense that these objects that they found from 3,000 years ago 
were actually um, worn only by you know certain uh, by by a particular gender, and they were making no determinations about sexuality, of course. Um, and the reason that I say, of course, is that you know there is nothing on the record that tells us about this. If you're going off the record, um, and you know this tends to, there tends to be this push towards ensuring that something can be um, truthful in the retelling of this. But of course, there's an interesting problem with that, and that's that we don't spend. Sorry, I really will scoot through this. Um, we don't spend a great deal of time worrying about whether we can prove everything that we tell people about when they go into a museum. You know, you cannot say science will never change. Of course, we know that it does. Um, and yet there is this kind of push towards the idea of science being right. So in the London Before London, this is the um, Museum of London's work, they actually talk about people being there from 450,000 years ago. So they're not talking about modern humans, you know? I mean, it's remarkable. They're talking about different kinds of humans. And so, they, so that you end up with this kind of potential vagueness um, that's actually quite agentic, you know, that's inclusive, that's providing opportunities. So, sorry, I'll scoot through these. There was also another interesting moment. Imagine if, imagine in Australia we had a national museum that was just focused on um, our experiences. Imagine if our Aboriginal museum talked about how fantastic it was to be colonised. Imagine if that was the focus. And uh, there's a whole lot of museums, including the Museum of London, that spends its time focusing on that. And um, you know, this is a promotion of, um, at, this is Hadrian's Wall, but you know, it's a promotion of the idea of the Romans um, coming in and making England better. Um, and you know, so that there's the, it's built on the Roman wall. Um, that's Hadrian's Wall, sorry, I'm not I'm messing these things up. But um, you know, it's, that's uh, Museum of London, it's built on, uh, on the, the old Roman wall. There's this kind of idea of you know, promotion of this. And what I find fascinating about that is this idea that we are able to see a kind of celebration in the idea of being colonised in that. It's pretty problematic, you know, uh, but it's clearly part of, the, part of their um, origin story. And of course, I can only imagine that if you thought it was good to be colonised, you might think it's good to colonise other people too. Um, so there was some interesting moments that came up along the way, and because of those interesting moments, I forgot the sort of central thing. And I'm not going to finish on this, but I'll scoot through the, these photos just to say that there were very few ideas that weren't contemporary on sexuality in any of the work that I looked at, in any of the museum work that I, that I saw, in any of the museums that I visited. There were quite a lot of things that focused on gender and focused on gender roles. They were often far more conservative than the reading on, from that community and the writing from that community and the contemporary era work from that community. So people like Alex Wilson, who has challenged a whole lot of, who's a First Nations academic, who has challenged a whole lot of ideas of how women engage. Crowley Driscoll has challenged a whole lot of ideas on the stories that have been told from First Nations perspectives, but they're absent from these discussions. And so, um, so part of what I wanted to do is to look at, in looking at these museums, what was happening with uh, the idea of presenting a centralised ontology, you know, saying, uh, this is our origin story and this is what it looks like. And I actually went to the Creation Museum. I don't know if people know about the Creation Museum. It's a, yes, <laughs> it's lovely. I actually visited it, believe it or not. Um, it's in Kentucky. Well, it's kind of arguably in Kentucky. It's, there's a border that's just changed from Ohio. Um, and it is a very reactionary um, take on, uh, on re I guess, correcting some of the ideas that evolution delivers. And it's really 
an interesting space because it's quite, um, there's a, a child dangerously close to a dinosaur there. Um, so, so it talks about the, you know, creationism and it talks about, it talks about the challenge to evolution as creationism. And it, you know, it's a whole lot of, um, you know, dodgy science, um, but it's also, you know, our perspective. It's a cultural perspective, absolutely. And what was interesting was it was very different to, than going to somewhere like the Mashantucket Pequot Museum that also talked about origin story, that connected up the science with the, the perspectives to look at um, a whole lot of these museums that was really trying to think about complex ways of, um, of imagining um, the world. This was all about things are bad um, and they're bad because you've done the wrong thing. That's not a person giving birth to a tornado, but they're all the bad things that can happen in your life. So the guy at the end's taking drugs, there's skulls, um, and yeah, there's, uh, that's, you know, um, uh, graffiti is bad. Um, so I had this moment as I was going through where I thought, oh my God, it's like lesbians. And it's not lesbians, it's meant to be a man and a woman. Um, but, you know, it was an interesting space to be walking through. Um, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but that's me trying to look g gender, that's me trying to look girly, apparently with the clothes I had on hand at the time um, and the way I was standing. Uh, because I was really frightened being in there. I mean, I, I'm not telling you anything, you know, this is, this is a, a really reactionary space that was really pretty aggressive. And surprise, surprise, I was a bit uncomfortable. Um, but uh, it was also very in, a very interesting space to be in because part of what it was doing was resetting these ideas of what you believe. And of course, it's challenging science that can't really challenge back because good science doesn't go, we know everything that we're ever going to know. You know, whereas bad science <laughs> can actually do that. So. Um, so there's a, a really interesting moment that's come through with the Creation Museum, and that's that they've done a whole lot of work on queer marriage. They've done a whole lot of work on um, the, the, uh, yeah, that did, isn't actually what Jesus said, and also it's actually what John said Jesus said, so it's like passed on. Um, so and this is, you know, one of the walls. So there's all of this work that's about challenging um, gay marriage. What I didn't see in any of the First Nations museums, and I visited 270, 267 <coughs> of them were First Nations museums, um, I didn't see anything that said there was a problem with homosexuality, <laughs> and, but I similarly didn't see anything that talked about um, sexuality unless it was a contemporary artist making. And the contemporary artist making issue is the key one. Oh, interestingly, um, that's Noah's Ark. They, did a, they decided to reclaim the rainbow from us, um, so, which backfired, because actually it turns out we're really good on social media. Um, and look, there's books out there that you can look at, and there's, there's a lot of images out there, but I kind of want to talk to, wanted to talk about the dearth of material. Um, a Little Gay History is great. It starts to talk about First Nations context, but again, it's uncomfortable with it. And I'm uncomfortable with it, and I'm an Aboriginal person that feels comfortable about talking about some of this, but I'm uncomfortable because the hidden stories are really hard to tell. It's hard to tell those stories unless it, you connect it to the person. So in the NMAI, the exception has been four stories that are there where they're actually talking about um, their own lives. So we privilege their voices and contribution. It's the way that it happens. And so my, I'll finish on this, but it's that Bunjalaka at Melbourne Museum, I think does a really great job with this. And it's partly because it's, tell, it's getting people to tell their own stories of what's mattered to them. And there are multiple stories from um, Aboriginal and a few Torres Strait Islander people as well, but mostly Aboriginal people and mostly people from Victoria um, who are, who represent the diversity of, of, you know, of gender and sexuality, but also are complete in a whole lot of other ways, you know, where it's a part and a facet of, of who and, and what we are. And 
this kind of you know, level of diversity is actually something that is really being um, seeded in First Nations museums and it's not happening in other contexts. And I think the answer really is about curatorial practice. And I missed about half of my slides because I was talking way too much. Um, thanks. Are there any questions or thoughts or worries or ideas? Uh, first of all, thank you for your talk. It was really interesting. Um, I'm curious about um, how. So, so there are cultures um, where you have like Fafa Fini, which is like these. Um, so, in the Pacific Islands, people who have this kind of third gender, and it's been represented, I think, in some ways by, in the West, as hey, you know, gender isn't this binary. And I'm wondering whether you had anything to say about how that might be represented in, in museums. Yeah, and I think, I, I think it's some of the criticisms that Quayle Driscoll's had as well about the way that First Nations people in the kind of broad Americas have been presented as well. And I think he's got a really, uh, sorry, they've got a really Im important comment to make about that. And I think if I, um, are museums doing this well? No, um, but I think the answer is about the perceptions. I think it's the narrowing, the curatorial narrowing to perceptions of um, you know, what somebody who walks in off the street can know and understand about a community. And I think it's the social history, the, the muse social history museum problem. I think the problem's theirs to solve. The solution is definitely about the more agentic stuff. So the NMAI is a good example because, yeah, it's a social history museum for the most part, and then there's at least two exhibition spaces that are there that are bringing contemporary work to it, and they're frequently bringing work by queer artists um, because actually we punch above our weight. Like, we do really well in that space. Um, and so, and it's complex the way that it's that it's that that we're being shown, but it's contemporary. So, you know what what Quo Lee's talked about is the problem of not seeing this in in history or using some of these historic um, ideas that have been written down by someone, um, said by someone who's obviously not necessarily going to be invested and have and and where they haven't really challenged this. And so the you know the the example with Alex Wilson's work is that that she's very specifically talked about the problem of um, of that, that there is this imposition of skirts, this idea that that women always wore skirts. And so this has been reimposed by a whole lot of non-Indigenous people as an Indigenous trope, or an Indigenous practice, actually. And, um, and she just says, her answer to it is, it's a load of bullshit, because how on earth would they have been wandering around bulrushes with um, you know, with skirts, it just doesn't make sense. Their legs would have been ripped up. You know, so just practically, she says, this doesn't make sense. This is clearly, you know, a problem that, um, that you know, was presented at a particular time to have a really particular agenda. And we see it all the time here. I mean, the amount of times that you can get idiots. Um, and I will say people who are really um, great people in a whole lot of other ways, but who will say, oh, you know, there was never any queer people in Aboriginal community. I mean, that kind of notion is one that we challenge constantly. And I'd say that, you know, the, the space that I think is really important is any texts that we can have that challenge this. I think you've got, that's um, uh, Colouring the Rainbow, Black, Queer and Trans Perspectives. Us Women, Our Ways, Our World has a few stories about queer women. Um, Bold, which is stories of, of older lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and intersex people, um, and uh, I'll just, it's got, it's got um, 60 stories in there, and seven of them are First Nations people, and Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander, actually, in all cases, and it's also, I should just say, edited by my brother. Um, but it's, you know, these are really important um, tools for us to have. Museums are super conservative, and they're like the that it's hard, it's really hard, and it's not because the people who work there are, are necessarily conservative, but they have, a, you know, they have a lot of these competing concerns. And so I think, uh, you know, I th the, the answer is, if I had really fabulous stuff, 
I would be showing it. There isn't fabulous stuff. But I certainly heard people, going back through, I heard people talk about confusion, particularly around gender, historically, um, and confusion around whether they were making decisions about things. Who makes the decision is key here. Yeah, and it's curator. Thank you. <laughs> Ta. I'd next like to introduce our second speaker today, Willa Mawada. Uh, Willa Mawada is an Aboriginal man from the Kalkatongu and Eastern Oriental Nations in northwest Queensland and Central Australia. He has a Master of Social Science majoring in Indigenous Studies and focuses on customary ethics and values. He's an Indigenous Australian leader with an International Indigenous Working Group for HIV and AIDS, a former board member of the International Lesbian, Gay, Transgender and Intersex Association, Oceana. His work includes being an academic in research with the Faculty of Health Sciences at the University of Sydney, State Manager, the Indigenous Program of Queensland AIDS Council and Consultant for HIV and AIDS programs in Papua New Guinea. Willow's presentation is titled Public Health Determined Statistics for Double Colonised Populations. Indigenous Australians' knowledges of gender diverse and same-sex attracted people's roles and responsibilities within kinship families. The presentation explores lived experiences and comparisons with peer-reviewed literature on Indigenous roles and responsibilities within kinship structures, the overlap of gender and sexuality within Indigenous worldview and constructs of individual roles. These are explored through his own lived experience and his own 40 years of advocacy and representation at local, regional, state and national international levels. Finally, the presentation ties into national statistical data for Indigenous Australian gender diverse and same-sex attracted populations, which is ambiguous on public health determinants. Please join me in welcoming Willow to the stage. It sounds deadly, but it's not as deadly as it sounds. I'd just like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. I'm really so happy to be in Sydney because I first left my community to come down here to study in 1980. And uh, a Gadigal elder, old Chika Dixon, and, and now his children and grandchildren have always been in my family and I feel so comfortable being in Sydney. And it's because of the traditional people here. So. I acknowledge the Gadigal people, pay my respects to the ancestors and all the elders there and the people here today. I am Kalkatungu, that's my father from eastern, from western uh, Queensland, northwestern Queensland, the Mount Isa region, and eastern Aranta Aliwara from central Australia, east of Alice Springs. Uh, Alice Springs is more central Aranta. And it's the same as I'm the same heritage as Charlie Perkins, who has a centre here and was the first Aboriginal uh, person to get a degree at the university. I'm following his footsteps, he's, uh, I call him uncle, and I'd like to continue on that. I've been a community activist for, for quite a while around HIV and gender. So I give you some things of gender and sexuality with myself. My mother was grown up by her grandparents, their traditional um, Aranta people, and uh, she married a, what we call in broken English, a town black. She's from a station, and she married a fair-skinned man from, from the town, Camerwell, which is not a very big town. Mount Isa wasn't even a big place at that time. Cloncurry was the big uh, mecca centre in northwest Queensland. The difference, the diversity in that is that mum's father was a white station owner who made children with a lot of black men, black, black women, sorry. And uh, so she's got a lot of brothers and sisters from her white father. But uh, my great grandparents had, had travelled, walked from Central Desert to uh, Western Queensland we're sister nations as well, so there's some lines there that connect us, had come there and they looked after my mother. So every time my mother went anywhere, my great-grandparents went as well. So when she was removed from the station to go work on another station as a domestic about eight or nine years old, my great-grandparents packed up and walked to that station where my mother was taken. 
She learned a lot of them. He was a lawman. My last name is Muwara. It's after him as, as that lawman. I'm not a lawman. I haven't been through initiation. And this is the whole part of my gender and sexuality story. We spent six months of the year on a cattle station because this is wet country up here. Two seasons, wet and dry. On the dry parts of the season, we spent on the station and I'd done my schooling by correspondence. Very, very high grades. My mother was my teacher. She only went to grade three. But her dream was to be either a botanist or a geologist. So she had an interest in, in science. And she encouraged that in me as well. Uh, when we were in town in Mount Isa, she worked in a laundromat. When we were on the station, she worked as a, a domestic and a cook. When I came to town, I went to school with everybody else. It wasn't segregated in Mount Isa. Black and white kids all went to school together. But there was still the white Australian policy. Most of my family lived in camps along the riverbank. My great-grandparents lived in a car junkyard. And so when they were babysitting me, I was staying in the car junkyard. But next door to the junkyard was a house that was owned by Torres Strait Islander people. I often thought that the woman there was my grandmother's sister because she called my great-grandmother mum as well. So I had no understanding about Torres Strait Islanders or Aboriginal people. To me, that was my grandmother's sister. Uh, but spending that time with my great-grandparents and him being a lawman and her, you know, very grounded in who she was, gave me my interest in, in later in life, is that people don't really look at the philosophy of, of law and how that is linked to the values and ethics of who we are as individuals and our responsibilities according to our roles in society. And they stem from our roles within our family, our kinship systems. I knew I was a day dot, a queen. We'd say queenie at first, that's what I grew up knowing, queenie. The derogatory names they used to call us was cat, sort of poofta, didn't really hear faggot much. Girl boy, uh, those sorts of uh, things. And they'd be in English and in language as well. So, uh, the, we now see the words sister girl and brother boy. This is what were terms of an endearment for us from our family members and community who'd see us. They, so they'd say, come here sister girl. So it's acknowledging you. And it, today it's, go, it's going to mean trans uh, women, uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander trans women. But when I was growing up, it meant even effeminate males. It didn't matter about the sexuality. The sexualization is something that's come later. And we, don't, we haven't really explored that. So you do see people arguing about, you can't be a sister girl because you're a gay man and these sorts of things. We don't have the uh, power to even begin these discussions in an amiable, respectful way because we sit in a situation where we are oppressed people. This is why I'm talking about double colonisation. And I'm taking this sort of theory from Edward Said's book of Orient Orientalism. I don't know if, has anybody read that? Okay. Where Edward uh, Said is talking about women uh, in colonised countries. And particularly he's, he's talking around the Middle Eastern countries. And what happens is the, you live in a colonised country, the man is out there doing the work, being assimilated and colonised in it, then coming home and colonising his wife or the females in the family. So using an outside culture to change the way of the relationship between males and females. So the woman is colonised overall by the country because of the colonisation, but then again colonised by whatever has been brought in and fed to the man, who's the dominant person in the family. And as the minority groups go down, then you can start to see double 
colonization. So a woman is a minority within a, in a patriarchal state. Then when you talk about sexuality and, and other forms of gender, you can see that there are minorities within minorities. And it makes sense to me that these are forms of double colonization because you're fighting the colonizer, the overarching and oppressor, then the assimilated views that are not integrated but assimilated into a way, whether it's through Christianity, our, our introduction of another religion, uh, Christianity and Islam for us at home are the religions that are predominant in our communities. And they have, that have a lot of uh, influence on the way gender and sexuality is uh, observed in our communities. Now back to me, I was going up, you know, doing these things and being very girly, liking to dress up in girls' clothes and stuff like that. My father died just before I was born, so I was the only child with my mother. And because of the difficulties with the relationship with my mother and my father's family, who were predominantly, or predominantly all very fair-skinned people, and didn't like the fact that he'd stepped out of that clique of yellow people, we'll say, who live in town and married this woman who comes from a traditionally black family and culture, even though she had white blood in her. But my mother wanted to move into that because she felt more like that fitted her, the way she looked and, and her aspirations. Uh, although she's very traditionally adept, and she would not speak language to us or anybody else, and I've only seen her speak language a few times in my life to anybody, not even my great-grandmother and great-grandfather, who always spoke to us in language. Well, she made that choice. That was her choice as an individual to make. And, uh, and she aspired to that and with the education as well. Unfortunately, through all of that sort of marginalisation that my mother got, she ended up in violent relationships and alcohol. That became to a sort of head as I grew older and, and she had more children and I was looking after the children and staying home and looking after the children and becoming more feminised in a way, with my roles of washing, cleaning, cooking, because my mother would take off for weeks at end and leave me alone while her and her man took off. That all came to an end when um, they arrived back from fishing and me and the kids heard them. The kids were really excited. They were only tiny. I was about 13, came out, and they'd been drinking and fighting. And he ran over with the car and then backed the car back up over her again. And then we were all separated, the kids because she ended up in hospital. She didn't die. And I came back and lived with my grandmother, my father's mother. I didn't know what else to do. I'd, I could have went with my grandmother back out in the bush, out of Dajara, but I'd come back. I wanted to go to school. I really loved school. I came back. That wasn't working. And finally, my father's cousin came and got me. They. A big part of my family was taken to Palm Island from the Mount Isa region. Now they weren't so connected to my father's family because they'd been taken years and years ago. But my uncle was in town and he took me there because they have a big sister girl population on Palm Island and felt that that was a safe space for me. I'd be with the family where there'd be other role models that were, were you know, good people of the community. And that's where I went and I, you know, basically just went into living as a woman in Palm Island. My duties were looking after kids, being with elders, uh, anything that happened. We, we were also jesters. We were allowed to do whatever we liked to do. We could make fun of anybody at weddings, birthdays. We were like, you see jesters in the castle? We were like that. Nobody touches us and we'll mock people when they're getting married when they're having their birthdays, really critically satire. And we're allowed to do that. Our, my boyfriends at that time, you know, I was just sort of starting to date, were, were straight men, straight identified men. We didn't sleep with each other or even think about having sex with each other or even think about having sex with gay men or bisexual men. We 
identified as women and we were going to have heterosexual men. That was it. Uh, because with the role, the men seen us like that. There were any sister girls could have beards or everything. It was not about a, the body or the sexualization of a gender. It's about a spirit, about who you are, and the way that your roles and responsibilities play out. You can see what I look like now. The kids I grew up, grew up calling me Mum Willow. And there were a lot of kids. On Palm Island, I had eight brothers and seven sisters in the family that I was traditionally adopted in. There were 21 grandchildren there when I arrived, and I worked in the kindergarten. So I know kids. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of kids. And the little kids that I had that were, I had about five or six kids that I was responsible to. They called me Mum Willow. And in fact, tonight, the grand, some of the grandchildren are coming down for an R&B thing. The first time from Palm Island to come and see, you know, one of their idols. They're all into rap and R&B, so they're coming down. They'll be staying with me. The grandchildren called me Granddad Willow because I look like this. Their parents call me Mum Willow. Some call me Nan Willow. I don't care what they call me because I'm like this because I'm negotiating my way through this. I know what I'm doing to get easy access. I don't want to play with the bullshit of talking about my sexual or gender identity when my objective is a professorship or these things. This is irrelevant to me. My spirit will go through it. And my, res my resilience in coming through what I came through, this is what will get me through this heteronormative world. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are diverse in gender and sexuality have not been given a platform. The determinants of health that we see for everybody else are our determinants of health too, with diabetes, cardio cardiovascular, particularly suicide that's given more prominence, yet there's no tick box for gender or sexuality for us. There's male and female, but it's a daunting task to go into an Aboriginal medical service, particularly if it's not at your home, and even when it's at your home, and if I'm saying I'm a woman and I'm ticking for female, and then one say, yeah, we know you're just a girl, but you're not a woman, you have to tick this box here. There's no competency about gender and sexuality in indigenous, for indigenous health workers. Yet Nacho's got the mandate of LGBTI health, indigenous LGBTI health. We have to ask these questions and it's really terrible for the minority within communities to have to stand up to people that they respect as, as elders and people they respect as leaders and then discuss something like a tick box about the right to tick female without a lot of support because within our own communities of sister girls and brother boys uh, same-sex uh, attracted and gender diverse, we are also morally Christian as well. Many of us go to church. Many of them are grandparents staying at home with kids and living a heteronormative life. So they will follow the protocol that's been there. They won't fight the system that is supporting them at the moment. They only help younger people to negotiate their way through it. It's, a, it's another forced mode of assimilation, the double colonisation as you talk about it, as Said so, you know, articulately wrote about. And as Sandy said, we don't have that many people that are exploring the dynamics or the history or even the philosophy of, of who we are. We know that traditionally as the indigenous people there is a song line for us and there are dreaming stories. 
whether they have been withheld from us because of ceremonies such as initiation? Do what realm do they fit into with sacredness? If a bar barramundi begins life as a male and finishes life as a female, then Aboriginal people know about gender transformation. Because we're experts at obser observation of animals and understanding animals because they are our brothers and sisters. And we respect the lives that they live. It would not have gone unnoticed in 60,000 years that a barramundi started as a male and ended life as a female. <laughs> and the barramundi ceremony in some communities is a 10 year long process that shows you how important the dreaming is for this particular animal which is transforms from one gender to another gender. So philosophically, how do we start to explore that? My group from back home in Townsville, we started a group called Yarrawala, which is Calcutin for rainbow, Karawai, which is a Western Torres Strait language for rainbow, solidarity mob. We have our own group up there. And we came to the National Alliance and gave a presentation last year, or this year, earlier this year. In that presentation we painted a rainbow serpent and a traditional man came from my country, uh, Eastern Aranta, Aliwara, and helped to paint it. He would not speak about gender and he would not speak about sexuality but he would paint it because it's not his dreaming story to talk about. This is another thing. People, some people can talk about other people's dreaming stories. Some people cannot talk about their dreaming stories. There are rules and regulations. We live in a world of two laws. A Western law and an indigenous law. And when people have been for generations removed from this law and they're going back and finding it in in theory, in literature, and then reigniting it. Sometimes it's coming through old soul, souls being reborn. The interpretation then starts to change. So we have new dynamics about the evolution of culture and the, also the evolution of LORE and LAW, customary law. It's a big space that needs a lot of sensitivity because it's about people and it's about a very vulnerable people. A very low population on earth because our continuing culture, me having that connection with my great grandparents and that law of 60,000 years, there's not many people in the world that have that. And it Sometimes I feel like it just is not given the support that it could most definitely use to say, here we are, I see my young people talking about binaries, talking about pronouns, talking about all of these movement that came out of America, basically the movement of LGBTI, and John Oldman speaks about it when the HIV started to go. When, and I could see it happening in Papua New Guinea, that these constructs of sexuality and gender came with the workers from the Australian Federation of AIDS organisations and other AIDS organisations internationally. Their constructs came from America on sexuality and gender. And now you have people using these words but the interpretation of the terminologies are different. They have to be different because we have an obligation to a law that we live with. And when we're arguing with non-Indigenous people, it's about what does it mean? It's not about the philosophy or the background about where we come from and our spiritual holistic being. 
the, we don't have no statistics for lesbians who are pregnant in Aboriginal communities. What's the appropriate care and pathways for them? We don't have statistics for gay men about diabetes and heart disease. Are they, do they fit into the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander old people's homes? Are they comfortable there? There's been no research to say that what's provided for people living in poverty that who are same-sex attracted or gender diverse, that they are given the appropriate care and access to health care. I have my concerns about that because I'm getting older. I've got one leg, I'm 58, you know. I don't have a big lot of super and as soon as I pull that super out, there's my brothers and sisters. Aboriginal people have a culture called, a uh, behaviour called demand sharing and not many people know this and that was what was in my thesis is that unless you understand the ways that demand sharing happens within a community between certain roles within kinship systems, then you don't know. See? <laughs> Colin Ross, say hello, you just interrupted a lecture. Oh, hello. <laughs> All right, see you later. <laughs> That's a big mama queen too from in Queensland. They, I would like to do research around our gender. I try to fit it in, but there are pathways for our own health as a, as a broader population that needs fixing up. The population of 15 year olds or 13 year olds to 28 are at high risk. And so that's a priority for me. Amongst them are gender diverse and, and same sex attracted population. But they're all my kids, whether they're straight or they're bi or whatever, and they're all at risk. Low education, high suicide, high rates of sexually transmitted infections, high crime, imprisonment, incarceration, 100% in Northern Territory. We have an obligation if we know ways that work as Aboriginal people. And guess who misses out? The most marginalised, the most vulnerable. And it's heartbreaking for me that I have to make these decisions for a population of young people and then I can't concentrate on the most vulnerable within this already vulnerable, marginalised population of people. Our relationships between the diversity in Australia needs to get a lot better. We need to understand the concepts of decolonisation, indigenisation, cultural match, Indigenisation in universities does not work. When white people are indigenising programs that they read from theory, they are still in power. Decolonising calls on indigenous people to deconstruct current methodologies, theories, theoretical methodologies, methods and approaches, concepts, and then reconstruct them with indigenous terminologies and indigenous perspectives and philosophy. Marys have Karl Popper. We don't have no philosophy really. We have philosophies that is ambiguous. Everything is so ambiguous with us. In a country and in this university, the oldest university, the ambiguity with indigenous philosophies when they've got a policy here that's about embedding indigenous philosophies is ironic. Because where does it come from? The dreaming? And who could stand up and say, what is philosophy 
and what is dreaming. An indigenous person would find it hard to answer. If we're talking about the most able brains in the country coming together and working for the people and with the people rather than working to do something that organises people or is an outsider. We've got to get over the outsider, insider concept that's been part of positivism and post-positivism for far too long. The cause and effect is not the only way of analysing an issue or a problem in health or in, in social marginalisation, gent gentrification, Redfern. We see it. You just have to walk down the street and see from when I came to college here in 1980 to now in 2018, Redfern is not the same. The settlement, which is part of the university, but it's also an, an international entity as well, the settlement where we all volunteered with the kids in Redfern, is different now. My thing is it's about gender and sexuality. If we're going to talk about gender and sexuality, then we need to talk about Aboriginality and that identity. And then who has the responsibility of bringing together people and, and starting to work on a platform that is creating dialogue that is about trustworthy relationships, trusting relationships that hold some sort of values and ethical integrity and emancipates people from this strangled hole that's within our communities on marginalised populations. Nobody wants to see a child of 10 years old commit suicide. That's what's happening in our communities. At 10, it just cannot be tolerated anymore. So I'm, my lecture is really about advocating for this particular population and saying there's something more that we can do together. It's not a poor bugger me syndrome. It's an actual reality that's happening here to the oldest continuing culture on Mother Earth. The benefits for everybody is that our culture is about being a caretaker and a custodian. With the knowledges that we're talking about, there'll be particular knowledges for gender diverse people and same sex attracted. They're collective knowledges as well. They're not collective knowledges nationally, they're collective knowledges according to songlines and, and clan constructs. Yet there is no legal protection for collective knowledges. The only lawful way that you can protect knowledge is individual ownership, nationally and internationally. So we're not protected. We get out and share knowledges, I'm doing it now because it's going to be recorded. It's mine and it belongs to my people. We have to also then find the law to protect ourselves because there is no Bill of Rights in Australia. There is no protection for us to even own our own copyright of knowledges and design. Thank God we have people like Terry Janke, who's a lawyer, that does that work. But you can see there's so many interconnecting ways about being who we are and being able to do what we believe is doing, what we believe is knowing and that way of being who we are. That, at this time, doesn't allow for us to actually be ourselves. So the whole gender and the whole sexuality stuff, of course we're going to fight. Of course there's going to be lateral violence because we cannot fight a power above us. We lose all the time. We get jailed. It causes us to kill ourselves. So we turn on each other and we turn on each other bitterly with the most 
venom that we can get. Our men assault us. We assault our men and the women. We all become perpetrators and we all become victims. And then that behaviour is portrayed over the media and sells us as drunks, as pedophiles, as sexual abusers, as woman bashers, anything that you want. The thing that you've noticed about the oppression against us and particularly the oppression of men is how women have crossed gender lines. We've seen it where women have risen up to be warriors and lead warriors into war. We've seen it in this university that the most roles of leadership are women. We can see that women pick up roles of men from Aboriginal society, but there's no pathway then for a man. And then there you have a media outside that's saying these negative things about men. So it's not only gender diverse and same-sex attracted, it's all black men and black women in this country. And the, the consequence is that gender has been crossed over in our communities because somebody had to pick up and lead the way and the women did that. And that's written about everywhere. There's a lot of literature on it about how black women in this country have picked up the slack and taken on male roles, predominantly male roles, for the emancipation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And look, I think I'm going to stop there. That just gives you a, a sort of overview of what's happening, but I'm glad, I'll be happy to sort of articulate in more depth if you, there's any questions. Thank you. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. I, um, I just had a small question, which is uh, what you were saying at the end about Aboriginal women taking on um, traditional kind of male roles. Did you mean male roles from a Western construct or indigenous traditional roles that both, might be traditional both. male? Both. Traditional yeah. and also uh, the Western constructs as yeah. well. There's been way, uh, typical male dominated uh, roles or for particular sorts of social tasks that women have done. So you, you see now women going out and hunting bigger game, also taking on some ceremonial positions in guiding. There are some that are still predominantly male, but the, the area that used to be grey is starting to become a fine line. Men's and women's business, when you go and talk to traditional elders about it, depending on where they come, can clarify that down. We have a lot, and we fit into this as uh, same-sex attracted or gender diverse people. We fit into this thing of men's and women's business and the crossing of gender, and then our roles change. So I have a big thing to do with men, and I have a big thing to do with women, that women don't have with men and that men don't have with women. So don't think that our laws are like this, set in stone. They are not. It's a spiritual thing and we too much look at this here instead of what the soul is. What is the soul? Our rainbow serpent has been bisexual, has been male, has been female in different areas and has been non-gender. That's a creator. So that tells you that we are open to a spirit, a soul, rather than being defined as a gender. Does that sort of answer it? Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, you mentioned in your presentation that uh, the law concerning um, queer, transgender people perhaps hadn't been passed on in recent, more recent history or had been suppressed. Um, and yet uh, you were fortunate enough 
uh, in your teenage years to have lived on Palm Island and to have had the support of the community there and the sister girls. Mm -hmm. Is it also the case that in more recent years um, that communities like that are no longer prevalent and that people who are um, young people who are gay or queer or transgender would not find the support of a community like that any longer? That's Palm Island and places like Palm Island I still have a high population of trans women. It's a different culture with rap and the whole culture of rap with gangs and drugs and, and the men, that, the way that men play out, that's a, a different scenario to deal with. A lot of our girls end up as homeless living in the parks in town and they don't get accommodation back home so uh, uh, we have lots of things that, that uh, at the time when I was there, it was like uh, we were under the act at that time. So we had laws around us too and about, you know, going out and what we could do in the community and those sorts of things like that. Not saying that they were good, but uh, it's different from today because the economic base doesn't create us enough economy or uh, you know, cultural capital for for this population, even for accommodation or anything like that. They, we need the Maslow hierarchy to be looked at and just at least get that bottom one. Security, shelter, for, for, for our mob. But they are not the only one. They're straight boys and girls like that too. There's particularly abused children that come from families dealing with alcohol and drugs and, and uh, poverty. It's, yeah. I, you know, I, I don't want to paint a, a sort of really down weight scenario because there's still a lot of humour in, in this. There's still the acceptance that life is a celebration as well. So within these communities, those people that you might see in town as fringe dwellers, they are some of the strongest people ever. They make a choice to do what they do, and they do go back, and with the demand sharing that happens, they can demand, we can demand, I can just walk into a house. Like I walked to my sister's house on Palm Island, and one of the kids and grand said, where are you going? I said, I'm going to see my sister. They said, oh, you're not welcome here because my sister was fighting with the other sisters. And I just went, well, whatever, and walked in. And then I was saying to my sister, my sister started cooking up a feed, then came in growling behind me, swearing at me, calling me all names. My sister's cooked a feed thing. When she done that, they looked at how me and my sister were interacting and they just stopped. Because we don't even have it modelling for them sometimes. You know, modelling the behaviour. That shows there's a thing between sisters and brothers, or sisters and sister girls, mm -hmm that you kids with your new learnt homophobia <laughs> under rap and whatever means nothing to this here. Yeah. yeah. But where have they got that here in this institute? Mm. Yeah, I don't know. It's hard. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. The lifelong work of our next speaker can only be described as pioneering. Using the Elias Story Manganini, Darren Butterdine has worked the Sydney and Melbourne drag scene for over 35 years. As we view the photos of his work in the background, Darren will share the main highlights of his journey and some lessons learnt along the way. Thank you, Darren. Um, I, firstly, oops, I firstly want to acknowledge the uh, traditional owners of um, the land and um, pay my respects to uh, the elders of past and present. I think I'm like the comedy relief at the end of um, today's talking, so um, I don't usually get like to talk or get up in front of crowds when I'm a boy, but in drag, well, they didn't have enough tequila here at the um, university for everyone, for her to be here, but you'll see her up on the screen. Um, 
I started, um, I was born in um, Moree, North West New South Wales, in, but I lived in a little country town called Palamalawal, um, outside Moree till I was 11. Um, and moved to Moree when I was 16. There was no, um, no happiness in my childhood, to put it, the, to put it bluntly. Um, my father was a violent alcoholic. My, um, myself being frustrated and no um, support or anyone knowing what gay was in the country town of 500 people made it very frustrating for me growing up. Um, after a failed suicide attempt at 15, I um, moved to Sydney where I be, went to catering college. I got a job at the Opera House and I met a lot of wonderful people who makes it really hard for me to talk about my life today because a lot of them have passed. And um, they dared me to go into a competition at the famous Aub Aubrey Hotel on Oxford Street. And the worst thing you can do to an Aboriginal person is dare them to do something. <laughs> And so that dare ended up turning into a 35-year career so far. I um, was very lucky and fortunate at a chance meeting of meeting um, the wonderful and late Simone Troy from uh, Simone and Next Playgirls Review, one of the most beautiful um, sex changes that I've ever seen in my life. And um, she took me under her wing and she saw something in me that I don't. And I remember years ago she said to me, there's never been an Indigenous drag performer on this, the main stages of Australia before. She goes, you're going to be bigger than you think you, you, you can even imagine and remember for years to come. So she helped create that monster. Um, me and Doreen are like brother and sister. I hate her, she hates me. She stole my life, I steal her money. So <laughs> we do quite well together. I, so after the next four years performing in Sydney with um, some of the most um, recognised and biggest late and stars that are still here, I moved to Melbourne because I fell in love. Um, but the relationship started to be violent, so I walked out on the relationship because I wasn't going to be my mother. Um, but my drag career took off in Melbourne. I won a, competition, a um, talent quest in 1988 and won $1,000. Back then was a lot of money. And um, the drag star, iconic stars of Melbourne uh, saw something in me again. And I was asked to be in a show in a new group with um, Miss Candy, Ron Walker, and the late um, Kerry Lagore, Kevin Minogue, called The Lipsticks. And we performed for the next seven, eight years, every Thursday night at the iconic uh, Three Faces uh, nightclub with none of, none of the three of us missing one night or one Thursday night um, until I left the group about eight years into performing together, or as Melbourne still puts it, Diana left the Supremes. Um, another t uh, my next venture was I hosted a talent quest, which was called Dorian Stemmage Dis, which um, founded some of the um, stars of Melbourne today. Um, well, they say they were born in it. It, was, it ran for three seasons. Um, I was doing late night shows at another hotel called the Peel Hotel in Collingwood. Also keeping down a day job five days a week, working as a, um, a cook, I like to say, um, in a restaurant called Kazon Kings in Melbourne. Um, then uh, the opportunity to take over from one of Melbourne's legends, Doug Lucas, in a show with five male dancers. And I did, and the show was so successful that I was then asked to fill in for another performer, another legendary performer, um, Dulcie Dujour, for three weeks while Dulcie went on holiday. So we called the show Doreen's Day. The show, <laughs> the show that was supposed to run for three weeks ran for two and a half years. And um, Dulcie to this day has still never forgiven me for <laughs> and never taken another holiday. Um, <laughs> Also another relationship of mine with a, there where I thought I'd found the one. Um, I left the game after cheating, on his half, not mine. Um, but Doreen st still kept getting bigger and bigger in Melbourne. And um, 
I started to headline the warehouse parties, um, Red Raw and Winter Days, where I was a few examples. I exploded out of a volcano, being flipped by um, professional dancers to be in front and lead the professional dancers in choreography. For someone with two left feet that couldn't get it right once at rehearsals on the night seemed to not miss a step. Um, or on the top of a, a, a three-t cake with a 30-metre uh, skirt that was connected to each side of the warehouse party and naked dancers coming out of the cake. Um, I performed late at, late at night at the Peel Hotel for quite some time and then the opportunity came up to do another one more, another group show with um, Lucy, Stephen and um, the late Vivian St James in Melbourne and we were called Three's Company. The show ran for over a year before I broke up the group again and started what I like to call um, my favourite show in Melbourne, um, which I'll talk about the awards and all that at the end of all, the, all of this. Um, but it was called um, Doreen's Wonderworld and I roll, used to rollerblade in the opening video all around Melbourne and in, into the front doors of the hotel to Simon Townsend's Wonderworld theme. If everyone remembers that, it's on the 80s or 90s. And uh, in 2000, I had the opportunity to come back to Sydney and um, take my show from miming to live singing. And so I moved back to Sydney in 2000 and started working at Palms Night Club on Oxford Street. And back in singing back in the piano bar at the Albury Hotel, where it all started in 1984, and sang there until the pub closed for good. Um, over the last 18 years in Sydney, um, Doreen's performing has been constant. Um, I hosted a lot of karaoke because I think if you can host karaoke and to be able to bag the singer, you have to be able to sing. So it was always a good thing to come back when a singer would say, will you sing it? And, and then I would, and then they'd say, you're just showing off now and walk off the stage. And um, I worked with Monique Kelly at Scruffy Murphy's, one of the straightest pubs in Sydney. The Irish backpackers loved us on St Pat's days. Um, for seven and a half years, I worked in a straight sports bar for eight years in um, the casino before it was redone going in every uh, Friday night and turning the football off right near the end and saying, it's karaoke time. <laughs> well, you can imagine what they said back to me. Um, and then Thursday nights at the Oxford, the Stonewall Hotel on Oxford Street, and of course, for three different sets of managers at the Imperial Hotel. At the time when I was at the top of my game in um, my drag life, for the first time in my life, my personal life was going so well because I'd met the love of my life, a police officer. I, was the I used to say that I was the first Aboriginal that was allowed to sit in the front of the police car and ring the siren and not get in trouble. But yeah, I know it's so bad. <laughs> he committed suicide and died in my arms in 11 years ago today. And um, my life fell apart. I um, survived two more suicide attempts, three bouts of pneumonia, and I left Sydney for 18 months. And my sister, this is where family with Aboriginal comes in, she cut her house, my, my, my brother-in-law put up a fake wall. So there was a half of the house that I could stay into and I only had to come out if I wanted to. And the only reason I came out was because I saw her cleaner cutting corners and cleaning her house. So which is something we don't like. And um, my two great nieces were born at that time when I was at my lowest because I was 55 kilos and I was, well, my, I, I thought my life was over. And my niece put my two great nieces in my arms and said, they need you. So still to this day, they ring me every day if they lose a top I bought them or the little one especially, you know, if, if granny or, um, their mum is doing something wrong. I returned to Sydney um, to a community that re-embraced me as one of their stars. Um, I, it was at a fair day with the amazing Bob Down, Mark and uh, Cindy Pastel Ritchie, who Priscilla was um, based on, who, who guided me through the day 
on um, something that was probably one of the hardest days of my life, but also one that is now one of the ones that I remember the most. And still to this day, I, I don't know if I'd be here today if I um, couldn't be someone else under the makeup. Um, I leave all my personal life at the door. I don't think uh, uh, of it at all. I go in, I make everyone happy, even when I was at my most lowest and miserable. Because, well, that's what a true performer does. Um, I've achieved a lot for an Aboriginal drag performer in my, in my career. I was the first to be nominated for a CAPS Award in the 80s. Um, in Melbourne, I was the winner of the Rainbow Awards in Melbourne for Most Popular Drag Performer, 1995, Entertainer of the Year, 1996. I was a Diva Award winner in Melbourne for Most Popular Drag in 1999, Entertainer of the Year in 1998. And coming back to Sydney, in the first six months, I was nominated for a Sydney Diva Award in 2000. In 2001, I won a Diva Award for my, my, my live singing show for Variety Performer. And um, so now I was in a selected group, small group of people that had Diva Awards in both cities, which to a gay performer is, is supposed to be a pretty big thing. To me, it's just another thing to dust. Um, I've been flown all around the country, all over Australia for birthday parties. I've seen it straight weddings. Hopefully, I'll get to do that at a gay wedding soon. Um, I've been interviewed. Um, I've been an interviewer on the street for Mardi Gras, um, that was shown on TV uh, for SBS. I've um, I've judged jog shows at the Kings Cross Festival at one o'clock in the afternoon, <laughs> which every drag performer knows we like it when the sun goes down. Um, I performed in a, at an outback station in Alice Springs. In, my, in a thong dress with the opera house on my head, singing songs for Priscilla for, for Northern Territory tourism. Um, I've been flown back to Mel Melbourne earlier this year to um, be part of an exhibition called In and Out, and it's about uh, performers and designers and everyone in the uh, late 80s, early 90s in Melbourne. And I, they have a jeweled cape that I used to wear that was designed by the late designer Stephen Fitzgerald here in Sydney. And they flew me down for a photo shoot. They flew me down to do an interview. So when you go to the, um, and see the exhibition, you put on headphones, and when you come to my window, I'm telling the story about what happens backstage and, and certain quirks and everything that you know we have, which I can't mention today without swearing. So um, I've been flown back to Melbourne to uh, still perform and still packing out venues. Um, Melbourne now holds me as a legend, so I do feel old. Um, I'm in the process of um, writing my life story or getting my life story written for me in it, into book form because I would like it to be given to, or to be there for um, indigenous, gay, you know, sister, girlfriend, um, young queens, in uh, country towns, in outback communities like myself that feel isolated, and to show that you know you can do anything if you put your mind to it, or be anything. Um, I'm putting together my one woman show to celebrate 35 years that I hope to travel the country with. NITV filmed my 30 year anniversary show and said they'd be on board to film again. Um, I um, was part of the 40-year uh, anniversary um, of Mardi Gras last year, this year, sorry, with um, 40 other drag performers. I was the only Indigenous drag performer included, in, and uh, there were 40 of us on stage performing the opening um, show at the after party this year, just before Sher. Um, I was led all the athletes and uh, the um, officials out for the Sydney um, Gay Games. Um, I was part of the Sydney 2000 closing ceremony of the Olympics with the, everyone in the Priscilla bus. I've done, I'm part of a book called Beneath the Sequent with uh, 10 of Sydney's favourite drag queens. 
Um, I've had calendars illustrated by the fabulous uh, Melbourne illustrator Brett Willis. I've had photo shoots, interviews, radio interviews. Um, I've been May, was put on the cover of the gay paper when Kathy won the 400 metres. Thanks, Kathy. <laughs> but most of all, I, there's so much more that I, I could talk about, but I'm going to leave it short because I hate talking about myself and I'm so nervous up here. And um, I put it down to, you know, where you start your journey in life doesn't define where we can, um, where we can go or what we can do. You know, this week, for me personally, looking back on everything I've achieved was quite exhausting. I think um, <laughs> not bad for a little coloured boy from the bush. So um, I'd like to just say one thing, you know, I always say that I'm, my journey hasn't finished here, but I'm still travelling. So thank you very much for listening to my story. And, uh, if anyone has any questions, can you just keep them to yourself? No, no, I'm joking. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> ben, and this is something that I didn't talk about, but it's resilience. And there's, in our community, it seems like the resilience is, is a dominant way of surviving and addressing what's going on. Can you just yarn about how that is for you? Oh, resilience. <clears throat> I don't know. I, for me, like I suffer from heavy depression, but the minute that I, you know, if I have to perform that night, the minute the makeup comes on, everything's forgotten, you know, and like I can walk into a venue and I've always will um, put in a somewhere in my performance that I am Aboriginal or there's an Aboriginal man under the makeup, I'll change the words to a song or whatever. And to what, what I love about performing and being resilient is when I can look out at a crowd when I'm performing and mostly white over the years and they're not thinking about anything else that's going on in their life and they're concentrating on an Aboriginal man up there in a dress. I mean, I'm a proud um, Camilla Roy man. I always have been, and I always will be. And I don't know where our strength comes from. I do believe it's from, you know, our ancestors. I mean, you know, when I've, I've been through some horrible um, personal tragedies, but my spirit was never broken. And I think that's the thing with us. You know, we can be, you can tear our, tear our hearts out and we'll, um, you know, step on them, whatever, but you'll never break our spirits. So. That answer. Thank you. Thank you.